the eight yachts leave New Zealand, they're entering one of the toughest expanses of water in the world, the Southern Ocean, and its end point, the formidable storm-swept Cape Horn. The Cape Horn Seagull. Hooray! <laughs> Along the way, there's more trouble for the Swedes. There's icebergs and driving seas. It was a pretty scary sort of uh, thing. It was like, it's like driving a car in the middle of the night with no headlights on on the wrong side of the road. And another of the yachts runs into rudder trouble. We're absolutely devastated because this was our big move that we're making in the west. And uh, we're making huge, huge gains on the fleet. Last time on the Volvo Ocean Race, the fleet completed the Australia to New Zealand leg, competing in the Sydney Hobart race along the way. extreme conditions. It was tough for all the boats and the Swedish syndicate SEB were forced to retire with a damaged rudder just 40 hours into the leg. We're heading north. Everybody else is heading south. So it's very painful. However, it was the previously troubled Asa Abloy who overcame their difficulties to win both the Sydney Hobart race and the overall leg. Fantastic! <laughs> One victory there, Sydney Hobart, another victory there, uh, Sydney Auckland, yes. Incredibly close sailing by all the yachts ensured that spectators in Auckland, the city of sails, weren't disappointed. Indeed, there were only six minutes difference between third and fifth places. Auckland is the longest stopover for the crews, and while there's the usual maintenance to attend to, there are also some crew changes being made. The Norta Syndicate, Amma Sports 1 and 2, have both brought new people in for this intense next leg. Currently in last place overall, Amma Sports 2 are making changes in key areas by replacing navigator Genevieve White and helm Sharon Ferris with two of Britain's best women sailors, Miranda Merrin and Emma Richards. It's actually a challenge I'm looking forward to. Um, it wasn't something I particularly expected, but it is very daunting to join the team um, this late uh, after three legs. So I, mean, I think they've almost done half the mileage of the entire race. And uh, you know, to come in against, to come in as navigator against the world's best navigators in, uh, on other boats, I couldn't possibly hope to be anything like as good. But uh, I will do my best. And uh, it's not a solo job on this boat. I know that the task is shared out a little bit. There will be a lot of pressure on the newcomers to make a difference on what is arguably the toughest leg. If I was told I could only pick one leg of the whole race, this would be it anyway. So for me, it's the perfect time to come in. I love, um, I love big wind, uh, downwind sailing. And um, so we'll have a couple of days to get used to the boat before we hit the Southern Ocean. And then um, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. The other Nauta Challenge yacht, Amma Sports 1, skippered by Grant Dalton, will be scaring the other crews by playing a huge trump card, recruiting Paul Kayard, the current race title holder. Well, the opportunity arose simply because of Dee Smith's shoulder injury, otherwise we would continue on as we are. Um, if I was on another boat and I heard that Kay was coming to sail with whoever, and I would go, damn, you know, we should have him. Uh, and I think it, it, to us it sends a message that, that, you know, we are a campaign on the rise, I think. You know, I'm surprised we're in second place, I'm delighted we're in second place. I, and, you know, when we started this whole race with nine legs, I thought, well, by Auckland, I want to be on the pace, but I never really expected it to be much better than, say, fifth. I'm sure that having the defending or the current winner show up is news, and that's flattering, but, uh, you know, we'll just have to see how it goes. I can't make any promises. I'm not expecting to, you know, miraculously carry the boat around the course or anything like that. I can just do, what, you know, the best job I can. The guy's good. He's one of the best, maybe he's the best. I'm um, sorry, he brings expertise in driving and, 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 and just physical drive as well. Tactical, he won this league out of Auckland last time and he won it easily. Uh, I mean, he brings, it, he brings experience everywhere for us. He just ups the ante for us. He ups our whole skill base uh, in every way possible. 
what is really in it for me. I've, I've won this leg, I've won the whole race, and I guess what's really in it for me is it's just an adventure. And like all really worthwhile adventure, there's a little bit of risk and a little bit of danger because that's what makes it even that much more special, like climbing Mount Everest. Of course, I have a family and everything to think about, but still, I think the risk is uh, manageable and the adventure is uh, about the best you can find. So it looks like the guys have got a first-class program together, very professional, and all in all, I'm really looking forward to a great ride around Cape Horn and to Rio. The reason I'm excited is not just because we've got poor card sailing, it's because you know, I'm playing out a strategy, and the strategy so far is coming OK. You know, and this is the next chapter in the book that I'm you know, trying to write of this race. And I feel we can win the race too, which, you know, up until probably Auckland, I wasn't sure. It remains to be seen if these changes will significantly improve the Nauta Syndicate's positions during the 6,700 nautical mile leg across the iceberg-ridden Southern Ocean to tropical Rio de Janeiro. New Zealand is a country of rare seismic beauty. Glacial mountains, fast flowing rivers, deep clear lakes, hissing geysers and boiling mud. Recently most famous for being the location for Lord of the Rings, and with a deep rooted history in sailing, it's an ideal halfway stage for the crews, giving them a perfect opportunity for rest and relaxation. Whilst many crews took well-deserved holidays, there are always those who just can't spend enough time on the water. Many of the yachtsmen competing in the Volvo race began their careers as dinghy sailors. The fleet includes former world champions Stig Westergaard, Richard Clark and Stu Bannatyne, who all raced in the highly competitive Finn class. Whilst in Auckland, the home of the America's Cup, an opportunity arose for a regatta, and the Volvo sailors jumped at the chance. It's just a good fun day. Everybody here is uh, here for a good time, and most of us haven't sailed fins for 10 years. And uh, you look at Russell and myself, we slipped back down to uh, our fighting weight, which is 10 or 15 kilos less than when we sailed fins. Anyway, it's just a good fun day. I haven't sailed a fin since the uh, 1984 Olympics. Really good fun, good racing, and it's, uh, it's a credit to the organisers that they pulled this together. The field of competition was intense, and the 14-man list of participants read like a who's who of yachting. It included the likes of Team New Zealand's America's Cup skipper Dean Barker and winner Russell Coots, who'd incidentally won an Olympic gold medal in the fin class in 1984. Although Russell seemed unhappy with his boat and made a few last-minute adjustments before the start. The racing was all incredibly close as you'd expect from such an experienced field. Fin sailing requires tremendous skill, strength and agility. But even though out of practice, the Volvo sailors were keeping their end up. This is what I grew up doing, this is what I've been doing for most of my life. So, yeah, you miss the uh, the tight competition. Mind you, this ball race is pretty tight, but, uh, you know, out there, there's lots of turns, there's lots of tacking, there's lots of position changes, and, uh, yeah, it's really, really exciting, a lot of fun. But it's great fun, it's really, it's good to be back in the fin. Everything, everything happens so much faster here, and the people here, the guys here, I mean, it's probably 
the best gathering of sailors we've seen for many, many years. Unsurprisingly, it was the current world champion who won on the day. Enjoy yourself sailing against some of these legends. Yeah, I think it was a really nice regatta. I really enjoyed it. And uh, actually, I think we should try to do it more often. It's unlikely such a collection of sailors will be assembled together again. But if New Zealand keep the America's Cup, Auckland could host another all-star Finn regatta in four years' time. This is a fantastic lineup. Once in a lifetime, it's never happened before. We've never had so many gold medalists and uh, Olympic medalists um, from such a collection over the Olympics. It's wonderful. Thank you for all sailing for us. Thanks, guys. As well as its superb scenery, New Zealand is also the home of extreme sports. And as if sailing around the world wasn't challenging enough, the crews, as ever, chose to spend some free time team building, Kiwi style. Push the tempo, push the tempo, push the tempo, push the tempo. For the Juice Dragons, there was a bit of navigation and driving practice. To do more of this. So, uh, at least now we know who's going to drive the next leg. It's all the bombman that's never been driving before. So that's uh, going to be pretty exciting. So, I look forward to the Southern Ocean after this. So it's going to be uh, interesting. Hopefully, we can keep a little straight the course. But uh, we're going to go a few, around a few islands, you know, on this trip. So, it'll be interesting. Whereas the Amasports 2 girls got as far above the water as possible. Oh my god, it's a long way down. Look at the size of my cars. Okay, drop it. I couldn't let go. I was like this. My, what? He's going, can you loosen your fingers up? I'm like, no, I can't. Can you count again, please? Yeah, I'm pretty nervous, actually. In fact, I might need a clean pair of shorts at the bottom. But <laughs> yeah, I'd much rather be in the Southern Ocean sailing around nice bigs at night than doing this sort of stuff. This is madness. Counting down. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. OK, three, two, one, big step. Oh, my god. Oh, my god. <laughs> This is great. This is really cool. I can't do it. Okay. No, we're not going to push you. Oh my god. Counting down. And three, two, one. Let it go. Again. Auckland's impressive sky tower must have been a beautiful sight to local boy Richard Mason as he helmed the leg three winners Asa Abloy over the finish line. Halfway around the world, ten months since I've been home. And, uh, wow, what a feeling. What an amazing feeling. I never dreamed, not one second, that this could happen. Whilst in port, he took some time out to explain what living conditions aboard a Volvo 60 are really like. Welcome inside the lady. This is the living room, the lounge, the TV room, the kitchen, the bathroom. And this is a generation plant. Pretty cramped down here, not a lot of room. This is about as much room as there ever is when it's empty. A few tools lying around the place. Uh, when we're sailing we have 18 sails down here and uh, 30 days worth of food. That's 15 bags we pack from each side. There's uh, two medical kits, sewing machine, Spears, sleeping bags, wet weather gear hanging up here, safety gear. By the time you pile all that lot down here, there's not a lot of room for the human beings. So uh, first stop should be the galley, I suppose, where we do all the cooking every day. We'll stand in here so we're nice and low down. This was where Magnus was in the last leg, Magnus Olsen. 
probably the most qualified uh, Volvo Ocean race cook there's ever been, five times around the world. Magnus, uh, Magnus hurt his back and um, was unable to come on deck, so I fed the boys and did a fantastic job waking up every morning, uh, every time we got out of our bunks to uh, a huge meal. I agree with this, this is much worse than any job they have done. Just look at this, look at the water, the gas is coming out everywhere and I have no control over it. And the boys are waiting for a good dinner and uh, I don't even have gas, it's a disaster. And round the side here, we've got the throne. This is where we like to interview our skipper, Neil McDonald. It's one of his favourite spots on the boat. Uh, it's not been a good day, I have to say. It's been one of the worst days so far. We've not done extraordinarily <laughs> well. And, and right now I'm taking my, um, my anger out on the toilet. It's a very uh, conveniently located little number. Toilet gimbals uh, either way up to weather or down to leeward. This is the pump. We've got a little foot pump down here, so you pump in the, uh, pump in the water, flush it out, and you pump everything out. And <clears throat> on this side here, so you can inspect that everything's gone out, and we also have a meter on board the Arthur Abloy to, uh, to measure the size of uh, our, our health and how well we're doing. Bit disgusting, really, but a bit of Volvo humour for you there. Just give me a second, if you would. <laughs> No problem, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll come back to you a little bit later. We'll give you a moment of peace up here. This is what we call a coffin, and uh, somebody has to get up here every time he wants to go to sleep, so I'll climb in, and uh, you can give you some idea of what it's like. And just remember that the boat's upright and still here. So you have to try and get in here. Over the top of your mate, who's sleeping underneath you. And remember, if your bunk stays like this, you roll out, so up she goes. I hope nobody from the crew sees this because it might prove that I can actually get in here and they'll make me come and sleep in it. There we go. Now you can go to sleep. Lots of room to move around. I can't even get my shoulders over. When I get in this bunk I have to come from down here. Can you imagine what it's like if you've got to get out in a hurry? Very uncomfortable. Quite often you wake up with the panics in here. On uh, some boats they actually keep a knife uh, duct taped to the roof so you can cut it and get yourself out. So very uncomfortable, the coffin. <laughs> now you've got to try and get out again. This is also fun. <laughs> Remember that the guy underneath is going to get upset when you stand on his head. There you go, I even cracked a sweat just getting in and out of there. So that's about it for our Spartan ship, the uh, lovely Arthur Abloy. So uh, maybe you can just think about us um, while you're sitting in your armchair, watching us blasting away down there in the southern ocean or sweating our way across the tropics. Six more months to go in this home, and then maybe I'll be able to get myself a real one uh, with a couch and a TV and watch the next lot of guys go around the race next time. And this next leg is the one to watch from an armchair. Leg four is 6,700 nautical miles of extreme sailing. After leaving Auckland, the fleet heads southeast to the depressions and strong winds of the roaring 40s and furious 50s, before reaching the most notorious marine landmark on Earth, Cape Horn. Then it's up the southeast coast of South America, where the crews may experience the vicious Pampero winds, before the typically light airs off tropical Rio de Janeiro. With the crews well rested and the boats repaired, all the preparations are now finished and all thoughts must turn to the next leg. Leaving port is always emotional, especially for the New Zealanders, who are liberally scattered throughout the fleet. And even when you've had plenty of practice, it doesn't get any easier. Well, it's tough leaving here. I've got, I don't know, now I'm standing on the boat, I'm feeling a lot better about it. But when I woke up this morning, I woke up about three o'clock this morning, I couldn't go back to sleep. And I, I find it hard leaving here, I really do. I mean, I've left here now six times and I haven't found it any easier. I think probably this is almost the hardest. Everyone, all, I think, always enjoys New Zealand. But again, it's going to the Southern Ocean, so it's always a bit chaotic, you know, getting the boats prepared for a big Southern Ocean leg. You know, you've got to double check and double check everything, make sure it's all okay, because you certainly don't want anything going wrong out there. Really, we've just got to have a good leg, you know. We're just looking to go out there and have a good, solid leg. Um, it's a, a, a real fine balance between you know pushing hard, not damaging the boat, and actually getting there. So it's a it's quite a nerve-wracking leg in that as, uh, from that aspect. 
certainly a lot of emotions this morning, uh, leaving home and going back down south. And of course, there's a race to continue with as well. So for us, uh, Auckland's been a dream stopover, and to leave it all behind and uh, head down to the icebergs and the cold is going to be a bit tough. After a disastrous third leg, where they were forced to retire after suffering rudder damage during the Sydney Hobart race, Team SEB need to do well in this leg. I did come across some interesting facts yesterday that we have 40 days of sailing left and 60% of the points are for grabs. And the first leg, which was nine, one ninth of the, all the points, was, uh, was uh, 35 days. So if you look at it from that perspective, still a lot of points up for grabs and it's too early to say that we have to win this leg. We have to do a good leg. We have to get up there and get the confidence that we can perform as we did on the second leg. Determined News Corp are holding on to third place overall. But skipper Jez Funston is not becoming complacent. We're um, focusing on this race, not last time, not the next one to come. And we're focusing on this leg, this race, this boat and this crew. And it's a great boat and it's a fantastic crew and we're looking forward to getting out there and taking it on. Overall leaders Ilbrook are still the boat to catch. With two victories already, can they make it a third, even though their skipper has never experienced what Cape Horn can offer? For me, this is the first time doing this leg. Um, I'm pretty keen to do it. Uh, rounding Cape Horn I know is a, a huge thing in a lot of uh, sailors' careers and um, I'd like to put that on my resume. For those that have sailed this Southern Ocean leg before, there are no illusions as to what it's like. I'm so nervous. I, um, last night I couldn't sleep. I was out walking. I didn't go to the prize giving. They were screaming and yelling at me, but I needed to my time by myself, and I'm still very, very nervous. It might be my last time in the Southern Ocean, so if I'm going to fight uh, any time, it's going to be now, and I'm going to make sure all our crew members are going to do 110%, and that's why we're going to win. It's like hell. I mean, uh, it's cold, it's windy, massive waves. Um, you're kind of high on adrenaline, but you're also very concerned about the welfare of the crew. Uh, there's a constant worry of ice. Um, if these boats hit ice, they're, they're finished. You know, that's the end, end of the race for us. Um, gosh, I mean, what else? It's, it's just unpleasant. Um, but it, throw that into a an competitive environment. There's boats around you. You know, you can gain or lose many miles each sked. It's, uh, it's a, hell of a hell of an environment to live in. To a massed crowd of cheering spectators that the fleet slowly leaves the city of sails and moves out towards the start line. The countdown is now on for leg four of the Volvo Ocean Race. Just a few minutes to go before the start of the toughest Southern Ocean leg, Auckland to Rio, in the Volvo Ocean Race. That's the gun, and the fleet are on their way. Tyco, Amma Sports One and SEB all got off to a good start. SEB, skippered by Gunnar Krantz with Marcel van Treef calling the tactics, are doing very well on their way to the first mark. Deduce Dragons in the windward position are slipping back from the leader Tyco and the green sails of SEB. Deduce were right up on the line with the first two, so skipper Canute Frostad will be concerned about their boat speed. Tyco are still leading closely, followed by Amma Sports One, skippered by Grant Dalton, then SEB. As the spectators close in on the fleet, there's more jostling and everyone has to keep a careful lookout. How you going well, guys? Keep it up. Keep working hard. But in real difficulties are Asa Abloy. After an awful start where they seem to be hanging back, skipper Neil McDonald will be concerned and trying to get back into the race. Amma Sports 2 also need to step up a gear. I don't know, we're losing tiny bits of speed against these guys, but I'm not sure why. 
The tall ship, Sorum Larsen, is alongside the first mark as Tycho leads the charge ahead of SEB, Amma Sports One and Ilbrook. The crews are changing sails to change gears, trying to maintain the fast and furious pace. It's incredibly close at the first mark. Meanwhile, News Corp is in fifth, followed by Deduce Dragons, then Amma Sports 2 and finally Asa Abloy. Some of the spectators are getting very close, but it's another enthusiastic Auckland farewell. Something that's become a bit of a tradition since 1977. This is the second and last mark out of Tor Bay on Auckland's North Shore. Tycho, skippered by Kevin Shoebridge, is first around, followed by Amma Sports One, skippered by Grant Dalton. So it's a couple of local boys setting the pace from SEB and then Team News Corp. It's interesting to note that they are going to the left while the first three have gone right. News Corp are trying to get out of the spectator wash. It'll be interesting to see whether they benefit from an easier seaway. The fleet's really split out here on the Haraki Gulf. Got a couple of guys, some local knowledge to weather, and a couple of local knowledge down to Lured as well. So we're kind of trying to play, play our own boat speed and make our own shifts and try and find our own lane getting out here and avoid a lot of the spectator watch, which is what, what seems to be bouncing us around a little bit. Avoiding the spectator wash has really paid off for News Corp, and now they're right up there with Tycho. So after the rousing Auckland farewell, the fleet is alone again and quickly settling back into the groove. So it's goodbye from New Zealand as they head towards Rio de Janeiro via the most famous mariner's landmark of them all, Cape Horn. As the fleet moved down the east coast of New Zealand, the racing is very close. Local boy Kevin Shoebridge and Tycho initially managed to hold on to the lead. Then, for the next four days, the lead constantly changed as most of the fleet were within sight of each other, separated by roughly 15 miles. Although Amersports 2 had started to slip behind. So, can you uh, tell us about uh, how it feels to have SEB behind us? <laughs> that feels good to have SEB behind us. But um, I can't say that on tape. Anyway, we have a lot of boats behind us. Actually, we have uh, Amer Sports down there. They're going to be behind us when they attack. Uh, I think Ilbrook is pretty close with us. And it's going to be interesting to see the guys that went far into the Bay of Plenty. There's only one thing there's not plenty of in Bay of Plenty, and that's wind, I can tell you that. And we have uh, M1 and Ilbrook down here, and then a long way down there. As I have Loy and News Corp, there seems uh, like a separation in the breeze plus a more left hand shift up here. So since last night, there have been big changes, big losses, and big gains. Unusually light airs meant that it took the fleet longer than expected to leave the clutches of New Zealand, as well as sleepless nights due to almost constant match racing conditions. On day three, Amersports One found they had an unwelcome visitor when a small shark got caught in their propeller strut. During the night, we about three o'clock in the morning, we, there was a thud, and uh, it was pretty obvious we'd run into something, so... Uh, Phil Stefano off with his kit and into the water with all the boats around us. It cost us about a mile and uh, this is what he came back with. So it's, a, it's an effective way of fishing. Um, not usual, but effective. I've heard of sharks getting caught on boats before, but the first time I've ever caught one in that way. As the fleet moved further south at the end of their first week, the light pressure gave way to the beginnings of what the crews were expecting from the Southern Ocean. Treacherously rough seas, biting cold, snow, and the first reports of icebergs. Good afternoon on day eight, just had lunch with the chili con carne. One of the only meals that doesn't have peas in it. Um, we're at 58 and a half degrees south, it's pretty cold. We're amongst the snow and ice. And I'm sitting back here on the heater, trying to get a bit of life back into my my feet. And here we are, Southern Ocean, and we're seeing icebergs. And we're also, you know, it's, uh, it's we're calling it like uh, bergs and blizzards. 
We've had uh, huge icebergs and uh, incredible blizzards where uh, we've had so much snow on deck we could have a snowball fight. And that gives you a little indication upon how cold it is out here. It is really, really cold. Last night was probably the scariest night we've ever had. Uh, I think everyone was pretty much on edge. We had to uh, sail between two really big icebergs. I think one of them was about eight or nine miles long. And uh, of course, there's a lot of growlers, broken bits of ice and the water in between. It was a pretty scary sort of uh, thing. It was like It's like driving a car in the middle of the night with no headlights on on the wrong side of the road. And all the cars coming at you don't have their headlights on either. However, one boat was making the most of the spectacular phenomena. What I can't understand is uh, why we'd be out here doing this, but uh, if you see an awesome sight like that, it's really quite something to be out here in minus two degrees air temperature and two degrees of water temperature, and to pass something as big as your township at home is really quite extraordinary. I don't think I'll ever see one again. <laughs> The Southern Ocean is a unique expanse of water that never fails to leave an impression on those who sail through it. If I had to sum up the Southern Ocean in one word, it would just be extreme. This is a very extreme place. Even today, you know, relatively cruisy, cruising along here, you know, 18, 20 knots of breeze, relatively comfortable. But you look around us, and there are some massive, massive snowstorms around. And uh, yeah, you sort of cruise along here and then wait for the big storm, and then the storm hits and you settle in for a scary ride. And then it gets calm again. So even on calm, nice days like this, it's extreme. We've seen extremely large icebergs. We've hit an extremely large fish. We've had some extreme speed, some extreme winds. Some extreme fun, some extreme terror, some extreme fatigue, extreme wetness. Extremely hot Mexican chicken. Extremely hot Mexican chicken, which isn't bad on an extremely cold day, but it's a bit of salting on the senses for breakfast. <laughs> However, the Southern Ocean wasn't going to let one boat in the fleet off quite so lightly. At around 6 in the morning on day 12, Gunnar Krantz's SEB suffered their second catastrophic failure in as many legs when their carbon rig snapped in 28 knots of wind. We all you know, quite got it over the situation. I think we have had our fair share of bad luck already. Don't need to top it up with this, uh, this small thing. But uh, it has happened, it's here, in reality. We just have to deal with it. The mast, which normally towers 28 meters above the sea when upright, was cut away from the boat to avoid further structural damage, and a temporary sail had to be improvised. So we've got half a boom and about a third of a spinnaker pole joined together. Uh, front end of the boom, so we can uh, put it back on the gooseneck knuckle and hinge it up, swing it up into the sky, and give us about eight meters in length above the deck. This leaves SEB dangerously crippled with over 1,000 miles to sail before Cape Horn. Meanwhile, the rest of the fleet battle on through the Southern Ocean. News Corp decides to head north away from the ice-strewn waters. Ilbrook are maintaining their lead 25 miles ahead of the chasing pack, who remain fairly bunched. As day 14 dawns, News Corp move up to third, proving their decision to go north was correct, whereas Amersports 2 are now nearly 600 miles behind the leader. As the crews head towards the end of the Southern Ocean, there's just one formidable obstacle left to overcome, the infamous Cape Horn. OK, here we are aboard Aegis. Last day into Cape Horn, grinding the boats in front of us back, hopefully. And uh, we're looking forward to the last stage. From Cape Horn up to Brazil, where we're gonna do a really awesome maneuver. Wait and see. It's been wet, cold, uh, quite exhilarating. Some of the best sailing I think I've ever done, certainly on a monohull. 
and uh, yes, yeah, so we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Rounding the Cape is still the ultimate achievement for every sailor. When the Volvo fleet round the Horn, they'll be directly following the route all sailors had to before the building of the Panama Canal. In 1522, Ferdinand Magellan was the first to discover a route, subsequently named the Magellan Straits, although the first voyage round the actual Horn was done in 1616. Since then, many famous maritime names have attempted the voyage with varying degrees of success. Prior to the first Whitbread race in 1973, less than 10 private sports yachts had ever rounded the Cape successfully. Following a week of ice-ridden stormy waters, it must have been a relief for Ilbrook to round the horn first on day 15 in rather pleasant conditions. The Cape Horn Seagar. Right. <laughs> a moment of celebration for the crew. As the rest of the teams passed this historic landmark, there were varying reactions. The first and last time I see the horn, I never go in the Southern Ocean again. Completed it, completed it, all over. Magnus Olsen, your fifth time around Cape Horn, mate. Is this going to be the last? Yes, it's going to be the last. <laughs> I promise, it's going to be the last. I mean, it's such a beautiful place. It's, it's hard to describe how beautiful it is. I think it's the world's most beautiful place. And... Uh, uh, 12 years ago when I came here, uh, I brought water from uh, this place in a little bottle and I christened my boys in that water, so of course it's good memories to go around here. In Australian tradition, son, whenever you go past a horn, a new up is required. Well, here we are at last. It's been a long time coming and a very welcome sight. Marks the end of the Southern Ocean, which has been a very cruel thing, very hard two weeks of sailing and um, it's going to get out of there in one piece relatively and um, taking the battle on for the next 2,100 miles to Rio. Whilst seven of the crews celebrated a safe and pleasant passage round one of the world's deadliest stretches of water, one unlucky boat was without a mast and looking at a very different landscape. Humbles you. Tell you, the stuff like this, it's pretty awesome. I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's, um, if it's any consolation for not getting to go around the horn, I guess this is it. Mind you, I'd rather go around the horn, so I'll have to do that later. But uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome, pretty wild sort of country. So uh, not many people have um, been able to see all this. I don't think I'll ever see it again. For the second time in the race, Team SEB have been forced to retire and must put into Chile for repairs. Now they will really have to pull out all the stops in the next leg to remain in contention. But for the other seven teams, there's still 2,000 action-packed miles to go before the end of the leg and the welcome haven of Rio de Janeiro. This is the final stage of leg four of the demanding round the world yacht race. After successfully rounding the horn, the crews must now head up the east coast of South America towards Rio. As the fleet approach the Falkland Islands, there's a welcoming committee for the front runners.
friendly salute from two Tornado F3 crews from Flight 1435, based on the Falkland Islands, to speed them on their way. So the big decision now is how to work our way up the coast, whether we should go outside the Falkland Islands or inside. And that's probably one of the biggest decisions of this leg, uh, also of the race. It's a, it's a big technical call. 500 miles behind the leaders, Amasports Sports 2 are only just coming to the end of the Southern Ocean. The Falklands provide a tactical challenge for the fleet. Which side to go round? There are possible gains from either option. Amasports Sports 1 and Deduce Dragons broke from the pack to take the easterly route. However, Asa Abloy's Mark Rudiger wasn't prepared to move away from Tycho and News Corp, who were following Ilbrook. As the fleet closed up again, it looked like Canute Frostad's cunning plan had paid off as he's moved to Deuce Dragons up two places and is now in contention for a possible podium finish. But with just under a thousand miles to go, another boat fell foul of technical failure. After surviving an iceberg impact in the Southern Ocean, News Corp became the fourth boat to suffer from rudder trouble. Three hours ago, we sheared our rudder off. We are absolutely devastated because this was our big move that we are making in the west and uh, we were making huge, huge gains on the fleet and we were charging into third place and we really had a good chance of um, having the crack at Tycho. I was um, just leaning on the rudder on the helm a little bit and the rudder just sheared off and um, that was it, it was all over. Uh, right now we have um, got an emergency rudder in place and we're making nine and a half, ten knots um, towards Rio. Um, we're still racing, we're still pushing hard. We still want to get into um, Rio in sixth place so that we get those points. With News Corp out of the running for a podium finish and with just a short distance left to go, the wind died and the front runners bunched up, making it anyone's race. Well, we got a little bit of a split with the fleet. Um, they're a little more westerly. We're a little bit out to the uh, northeast on them. It's a little scary at the moment, but uh, they had a lot different wind than us last night and early this morning, so we weren't able to cover. So it makes it uh, a little nerve-wracking, but uh, we're hanging in there. We still have a 20-plus uh, mile lead on everybody, 70 miles to go. So hopefully uh, the wind gods are in our favor. Master Abroy, uh, almost 7,000 miles of ocean racing. And there's four of us within five miles. This is Tycho up here. Juice Dragons. We match racing our way into Rio. Unbelievable. After such a long voyage, it's ironic that the fleet are floundering just off the coastline of Rio. Places that seem certain are now in doubt, and as each boat tries for that lucky breath of wind, frustration is setting in. What's the situation, mate? It's a load of old knob, that's the situation, summed up in one sentence. <laughs> the wind has gone away and left us all floundering. Floundering? Yes. We've got a few of the lads around us. Yeah, got some other boys. Um, not very happy faces, we just had a scab which puts us back in um, equal second with basically... Tycho, you can see down there, and Dolph, you won't be able to see, 23 miles over there. Yeah. They're all within three or four miles of each other, and it's basically in the hands of the wind gods now who comes home first. But it seems as though John Kostecki's offerings to the wind gods were more substantial. As after 23 days, 5 hours and 58 minutes, Ilbrook crossed the line to make it victory number three. such a long leg and, and we sailed so well we were expecting always expecting the worst out of my whole career the most nerve-wracking race I've ever been in a surprise second the following day was Canute Frostad's to juice dragons this puts their campaign back on track after a slow start I feel great 
it was a tough leg, and but we um, from horn and up we sailed fast and the right place, and it was it was great. A closely fought battle for third between Tycho and Asa Abloy was eventually won by Kevin Shoebridge's Tycho by about an hour. Even this morning at four o'clock, we were side by side with Essa. The last 24 hours, you know, we've only done about 120 miles or something ridiculous. And as you saw in the skids, we were all within two or three miles the whole time. So, you know, we're really happy to be third. So after leg four, here is the rundown of placings. Ilbrook have extended their margin at the front. Hammer Sports One only managed a fifth place, although they were just 28 minutes behind Asa Abloy. And Amasports Sports 2 failed to catch News Corp, despite their broken rudder. The overall placings now look like this. Although Ilbrook have a commanding lead, the chasing pack are reducing the difference, and there'll be fierce competition in the next leg to change the rankings. Following their second retirement, Team SEB will have a tough leg next time, but with five legs left, there's still everything to play for, and the overall outcome is still anyone's guess. Next time on the Volvo Ocean Race, the crews enjoy the many colourful delights of Rio during the carnival. Before the 4,450 mile trip north to Miami, USA.